Good morning, good morning. We still have some people in the waiting room. We will start in a few moments. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Welcome to our speakers and welcome to our audience. Uh, welcome to today's uh, seminar on the war in Ukraine and the international media coverage. We want to give an overview within this seminar and we want to shed some light on the media coverage about the war in different European countries. Uh, and we want to talk about how the first three months of the coverage can be evaluated. I'm greeting you from Vienna. My name is Daniela Kraus. I'm the General Secretary of the Press Club Concordia here in Vienna. This seminar is a part of a series of seminars that are organized and authored by Mirjana Tomic. Good morning, Mirjana. Good morning. Um, uh, and this is a, uh, the, these seminars are a cooperation uh, by Press Club Concordia, uh, which is the oldest press club in the world, actually, founded in 1859, uh, and the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, IWM, and FUM, Forum for Journalism and Media, uh, which is an institution for journalism training in Vienna. The series is sponsored uh, and made possible by Erste Stiftung, Erste Foundation uh, in Vienna. Please do note, we do live stream this talk. So welcome to everybody on YouTube too. Uh, and we also do record it. Uh, so you can rewatch and you also have the possibility for discussing and Q&A uh, after the input of our speakers. That's it uh, from my side. I think this is a very important topic today. Uh, so I hand over to Mirjana Tomic, who will also introduce the speakers. Thank you again for joining. Thank you so much, Daniela. Thank you to all of our partners. Good morning. My name is Mirjana Tomic, and I organize seminars on current affairs for journalists and academic researchers for Fium and Presse Club Concordia. I'm also a former war reporter who wrote for the Spanish newspaper El País covering the war in my own country, former Yugoslavia, and also in Central America. Thus, today's topic is very close to me, and I wish I had never had to address it. Uh, just a few remarks before I introduce the speakers and give them the word. They are the most important today. Number one, uh, war coverage consists of different levels. You, uh, coverage of what happens on the ground, then coverage of uh, journalists who sit in their office and base their reports on agencies or what others do. Then comments and commentators for radio, TV by people who may have never set foot on the ground or may have. And finally, diplomatic, uh, the coverage of diplomatic negotiations, international po uh, policies, global perspective. As a reporter, I covered only the first level. The, I was on the ground and I did not see the big picture where things moved differently and without urgency. On the ground, survival was a priority. At the time, I thought that only reporting from the spot mattered. And now I understand that all uh, levels matter because war developments depend on many factors. Peace on the ground is just as important as public opinion perceptions in different countries, especially if taxpayers are asked for sacrifice, if we still ignore the economic consequences of the war in Ukraine, uh, if uh, Western countries are supposed to send weapons. Uh, today is uh, exactly three months since Russia invaded Ukraine, and we still don't know the outcome of this war. We only see destruction, uh, massacres, human suffering. Most citizens in West Western Europe, when uh, uh, reading about or seeing the war, uh, they consult media in their own uh, language and in their own uh, countries which in turn has an impact on public support for policies related to all aspects of the war in Ukraine and policies uh, towards Russia. Uh, I, uh, I'm speaking already too much. I wanted to mention uh, one more thing that from my perspective here in Vienna and consulting media in several, uh, in several languages, as well as listening to web webinars, it seems to me that the coverage of the war in Ukraine has been interpreted as pro 
uh, Ukraine or against Russia, or if you question certain policies, then you're pro-Russian. I would like to say that I see things differently. I think that, uh, uh, and that when I, uh, if I ask you questions later on as to uh, critical reporting, I'm not referring to any sort of approval of, of the aggression. I'm just thinking uh, to what extent uh, the uh, information on what is happening on the ground in Ukraine should be diverse or there should be only uh, one narrative. And I will ask uh, Natalia about, uh, about that. Uh, I would like to also mention that from a Western perspective, and I live in Vienna now, I'm not in Ukraine. Uh, it seems to me that the, the objective of the war is less and less clear. It is not clear to me if uh, the objective is to liberate Ukraine or to defeat Russia. And uh, in fact, to, uh, three days ago, an article, an opinion, uh, editorial article appeared in the New York Times uh, called on the, uh, the 23rd of May called the war in Ukraine is getting complicated and America isn't ready. It is a very interesting uh, piece considering that uh, the US has just approved a $40 billion weapon and humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Today, by chance, Noya Zurich Zeitung had a long piece how in a free world citizens fear to express their opinion if this opinion goes against the mainstream. And um, uh, I would now, uh, uh, this is the format. I will have a short conversation with which uh, uh, one of our speakers, and then it will be open for opinions, short opinions and uh, questions by the audience. As usual, uh, our events are there to, for networking and for inspiring. I don't pretend we shall come up with, uh, with the truth at the end. Uh, our speakers are, uh, our first speaker is uh, Natalia, uh, <coughs> I, uh, sorry, I just uh, have uh, Natalia uh, Grumenyuk from uh, uh, Kiev. She is in Kiev and I am so happy that she has decided to join us. She is one of the co-founders of the independent uh, TV station Chromatsky. And uh, she happens to be in Kiev today. Normally she travels uh, covering the war. And I will start with you, Natalia. Just uh, I want to introduce the other speakers. Alexei Kovalev is the head of investigation uh, uh, in Medusa. He has more than 20 years experience in um, reporting. And I would like to say that I invited Alexei because Medusa is one of the main references in English and uh, I don't know, in Russian about independent uh, reporting about uh, Russia and partially from Russia. Alexei is right now in Riga. I have invited uh, Anna Litvinenko, this is the order. She will have to appear before uh, Tim because uh, she has to teach at 10 o'clock. And Anna uh, has been living in Germany for over a decade. She's a researcher at Freie Universität Berlin, specialized in digitalization. And I have asked Anna to give us an overview of the German media. Tim Judah, my colleague from 30 years ago or longer, uh, who covered the wars in the Balkans, just spent three months in Ukraine. So I would like him to, uh, to uh, working for The Economist and also writing for Financial Times and New York Book Review. Uh, I would like him to combine uh, how it was uh, reporting from the ground and what he sees as current reporting uh, in English. Then we have Laura Perez Rastrilla, who is uh, a young uh, expert on Western uh, war propaganda. She is a lecturer at uh, La Universidad Complutense in Madrid. And finally, <coughs> a life lunchman who will explain to us how uh, a former director of the public radio in Denmark who explained to us how Danish media has uh, reported Denmark has immediately uh, sided itself uh, with, uh, with Ukraine. And maybe our colleague from Le Monde, Marc Semon, he uh, just told me he will join later. He will also uh, tell us about uh, France. So I shall start now with uh, Natalia. Natalia, could you tell, uh, tell us Right now, what are your main topics? What is it that you want to tell your Ukrainian audience? That's one thing. And a second question is, several days ago, I met a very well-known Ukrainian professor of history, but who doesn't live in Ukraine now, he teaches in the US, 
And he told me he feel he thinks there is sort of a concordat between media and politics, what to talk about and what to not, not talk about. I mean, which topics to address and not to address in the time of war. Uh, the screen is your, uh, yours, Natalia. Hi, um, hello. Um, yeah, I um, so far report mainly for the international media, honestly, uh, but my organization, the Public Interest Journalism Lab, which I uh, represent, actually do research the uh, complexity of the uh, media coverage, uh, in particularly in sensitive topics. Uh, but I probably need to address a couple of things, first of all. Uh, what is uh, very um, unusual about the war in Ukraine, I think the world and international press is just just not very much used to the situation when the war is fought against uh, um, state against the uh, functional democracy, where the war while the war is fought, there is the political opposition, the parliament, the government, the civil society, a various media uh, which belong to different groups, but also which belong to the journalism itself. So uh, at the, so wherever I come, I have kind of more or less the same questions, which are coming the cliche from any kind of foreign war, where usually there is an opposition fighting authoritarian government. And, you know, there are the persecution and journalists and um, something like that. So anything could be published in Ukraine. Anything could be discussed in Ukraine. The biggest discussion in Ukraine, I'm, I'm speaking apart from the issues which directly connected to security. So there are two types of information where there is an agreement, but which I basically compare to something uh, in the West, when, for instance, people discuss whether the, um, you know, uh, when we, for instance, have the COVID, whether it would be responsible to, I don't know, do some things during the COVID. So by this, I mean the uh, the, the targets, which uh, the military uh, facilities, uh, which are targeted, uh, because we have a very clear case when the media, especially in the digital world, uh, uh, show something, uh, and then it helps uh, the, the Russian uh, army to target uh, the objects, including the civilian objects, including the hospital. So it's not really about the protecting military. It's really about uh, not making, not, not being absolutely helpful for the uh, Russian military intelligence. But in, but what is very important for us, uh, the question is always made: what is the public, um, what is the public? interest in, in in this and we clearly see the public interest is actually that the hospital isn't bombed and of course there are the maybe the debates sometimes that ukrainian journalists are not so much pushy to know at this moment the full number of the military uh, casualties however we do report on that there is a discussion on that for instance recently there was a news on uh one of the uh, military um compound being bombed and there is a huge discussion who is responsible for that why those people were staying in that compound that would be the kind of this thing uh that would be the the debate to how how ugly can be our political uh you know battles at the moment because they're still there and to what extent we should concentrate on them but we still report on them we still report and and and, and that's there so I do think that's something which is quite unusual. And I really want to return to this um, column, which I think it's quite, for a lot, Ukrainians found it a bit, you know, like a, a, a pretty, um, let's say, uh, for some insulting, for some weird, uh, with the idea that again and again, Ukraine is uh, not really, um, with everything which I mentioned, having the democratic society and having such a black and white uh, war when the government says more or less the same in, is united in that different political forces are more or less the same on the same page, the civil society and the media. And it's not about the mainstream. The, the idea is very simple. I think it's quite an okay idea to tell that, that one country cannot invade another country and people shouldn't be killed. So if it's a mainstream, okay. You know, like uh, if somebody comes with an idea that innocent people are allowed to be killed because they're Ukrainians and another country, uh, can invade another country. Okay, but I mean, I, I think it's it, it's not an issue of the you know ideas, but of some uh, of some facts. But I think that in this regard, Ukrainians at this point they do not care much about whether Ukraine 
uh, whether US is ready for this war, who is not ready for this war. The, the goal of this war is super simple. It's very clear and becoming even more clear with every day. Ukraine cannot afford their towns to be occupied. Because if their towns are occupied, there would be persecution, repressions, murders, everything we've seen in Bucha, Repin, and any other village. So if apart from the um, apart from uh, defending the cities uh, from being bombed, the second thing is that Ukraine cannot Ukraine it's it's a responsibility for the Ukrainian army and the government not to let uh, its own territory be given uh, for the occupying power. Um, so that's probably my uh, my my, uh, my uh, initial comment. Uh, mm -hmm. But the stories I'm particularly focused. It's it's really about showing the complexity of the Ukrainian society and in particularly how um, how it functions uh, during the war because I think it's the most untold and uncovered story. How it's work in with with its political diversity um, and you know how it's uh, happening to be an extremely functioning society during the. War war because what Ukrainians don't like to be to portray it as a victims. They are the victims of this war, but they are exactly they're not calling for compassion. They're really calling for solidarity and just explaining that they do the whole the whole uh, job on the ground. What is really tricky to finalize my comment. Um, I was grown up and I was you know taught uh, in the West and I mean, I didn't live in the West, but I mean, my journalistic career started during the war uh, of Iraq with telling how the Western media, what everything they did wrong in, in the, um, you know, in the Iraq or maybe in the Balkans. So I pretty much understand what's, what the debates are. However, the problem is that too often the old phantom fears of the Western media or others are just projected in Ukraine and are not then existing. Ukrainians don't care about you know how what the U.S. has been doing in Nicaragua, or what went wrong with the U.S. Uh, cooperation with Saudi Arabia. It has no relevance to this war. But any kind of this kind of alternative debates are coming to this 20th century debate about the spheres of influence, which has nothing to do with this war and has nothing to do with the Ukrainian society. And the Ukrainian society is very different from the societies which are you know uh, discussed in in all these articles. Uh, so that would be my, my, my final thought. I'll be very happy a bit later, maybe shortly mention the topic of the Russian propaganda, which I underestimated for many years, despite of everything and how instrumental it become. Uh, but that would be a different topic. And I think it's sure. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Natalia. I just want to make one thing clear. Uh, when I was speaking of mainstream and uh, narratives, the counter narratives, no one uh, was mentioning uh, the approval of the invasion. Uh, it is, uh, I was uh, referring to something else. I was referring to uh, the articles that appear on the uh, Ukrainian society. And uh, I'm not really, I have been to Ukraine once for three days in 2011. So, uh, but uh, you know, it is also for me very interesting to know uh, if I just um, uh, give you two facts, that according to Freedom House 2021, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian democracy was ranked as partially free. And uh, uh, now you say it is free, which is perfect for me. And I also, uh, I'm happy that there is a, that there is debate and uh, freedom in the media. I think it is a, a very important thing to to mention. Uh, Alexei, uh, you work for the media that uh, most Western journalists uh, uh, use uh, or, or read or consult. You address both Russian and uh, uh, international uh, audience. You had to leave Russia. I was, uh, everyone learned from Twitter that you left it on foot uh, um, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, you uh, write, uh, uh, you are Russian, so it's the country that invaded other country. Like uh, I wrote, uh, I, I'm a Serb writing for El País, so that, uh, and I know what it is like. Uh, and uh, talk, uh, you know, I belong to a nation that uh, sort of uh, started one war, not exactly. But I would like to tell. I would like to ask you: What topics are you focusing on? What are which topics you would not touch? Because we spoke about it before, and uh, we know. I, uh, I know from my experience, and it may be totally wrong, that even the worst propaganda sometimes tells some things that are true. 
Um, hi, uh, uh, thank you for having me, Mariana. And uh, yes, indeed, I'm, I'm in a very unique position, which probably skews my perspective, uh, because I am, um, I am a national of, an, uh, of the invading country. Uh, and I had to flee my country. I'm uh, working from exile. And uh, uh, I'm being told uh, every single day on uh, Russia state television that uh, I am some kind of cancer that should be excised. Uh, and uh, there's probably a criminal case waiting for me back home uh, uh, under the new uh, laws passed on the very same day that I crossed Russia's border, uh, which now all but guarantee me criminal prosecution uh, for what is um, the, the official formula is uh, spreading knowingly false uh, allegations about the, um, the state of the Russian armed forces, uh, which uh, in practice means anything that is not uh, disseminated in uh, Russian defense ministries, printouts and press releases. So for example, uh, when uh, we are investigating um, uh, Russian army's war crimes, that is clearly uh, within the purview of this new law because uh, since uh, the Russian Defense Ministry uh, hasn't admitted uh, one uh, single instance of alleged war crimes, uh, let alone uh, promise to investigate them. That means that anything we report on the uh, Russian army casualties, which the uh, Russian Defense Ministry is also not disclosing, uh, or the alleged war crimes, uh, it's all uh, basically a crime under the new law. So. Uh, uh, I've, done, I've uh, published enough bylined articles uh, to guarantee myself criminal prosecution under one of these laws. Uh, so it's very unlikely that uh, I'll be able to return home in, anytime soon. Um, but even, even, even said, said that, I don't think there is uh, uh, any topics that we at Medusa will not touch uh, because that would be... Uh, a grave breach, not only of our own charter, uh, but also of our trust with our, with our audience. If we know something that, that is newsworthy, but we choose not to report it, that would be uh, a really grave violation of, uh, of, uh, of our own basic ethics. Um, so I can't think of a single topic that we uh, would uh, refrain from covering. Uh, in fact, in the early in the uh, one of the uh, earliest stories that we published into this war is uh, how un unreliable uh, all uh, figures of casualties uh, released by all sides are, um, and how far removed they can be from reality. And uh, uh, we have we have an amazing team of experts uh, of uh, of war reporters that know that. Uh, uh, who are much better uh, at this than I am, who always give their most sober analysis of what's happening in, in, in the war. Uh, their analysis might not, might not necessarily confirm what, with what we expect and with, uh, with, uh, with whatever side we sympathize with, but, but this, is what, what, this is what's happening. This is what our audience expects of us. And this is why uh, even though Medusa is blocked inside Russia, we have now more readers on our website than we than we had before the war, uh, because for all intents and purposes, we are the only uh, news outlet publishing in Russia in, in Russian that has both uh, a reporter in, inside Ukraine on the ground and a team of experts uh, are covering this war from a, a bird's eye view, uh, and always giving. Uh, this is a, this is an issue of trust uh, because uh, our audience trusts us to give the most sober uh, assessment. So I don't think there is a. I can't really think of. Uh, I can't really. Well, uh, I have. Uh, I can think of one thing. I don't know how it. Uh, and uh, I will ask uh, Tim about it uh, again. I am not covering the war in Ukraine, but uh, for example, uh, in the Balkans, and I'm sure it's not only in the Balkans. Some civilian uh, institutions were used for weapons uh, and for defense. So. Sometimes, uh, you know, like a shopping center, from what I understand, it was used for defense. Is it a target or is it a not a target? Should, uh, uh, should one report on it? Should one not report on it? Um, well, of obviously, if, if that happens, if we see, uh, if, for example, if, uh, if we have a photograph or photographic evidence or satellite evidence of uh, uh, military armor uh, in uh, 
uh, cl close to uh, civilian infrastructure. Obviously, we will not uh, simply throw it away because it will make the Ukrainians look bad. But obviously, uh, uh, the context also matters here because it's easy to twist this. Uh, to, to twist this, and this is what exactly what uh, uh, the propaganda is doing. Oh, look, the Ukrainians are hiding behind schools and uh, and whatever. But also, they are def like they are defending. This is the, the context which must be clear that they are defending this city. And uh, how do you expect us uh, to def uh, How do you expect the military, a conventional military, defending in, uh, against another conventional army to defend the city against an invading force? to just uh, come out in, the, uh, in, in an open field and sit there like a sitting duck waiting to be uh, pulverized by the enemy's artillery. No, that's not how, you know, that's not how urban wars for, uh, are fought. And this was, uh, it, it, uh, uh, we obviously will report it for what it is, but the context must also, must also be clear. So we will not just release, a, this is something that we uh, actually try to avoid uh, 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 in our coverage is uh, giving, uncontextualized un images or videos or um, uh, or even um, uh, this is a very uh, this is something of a last resort that we do in terms of uh, 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 text coverage is um, uh, 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 simple monologues uh, in, in we sometimes do that for example when we have um, <coughs> uh, when we have uh, witness statements, when, uh, which we uh, publish as um, simple monologues of, uh, for example, survivors in, uh, uh, from Mariupol or the other cities besieged by the Russian army. But I also, uh, this, this is for, for me, uh, despite uh, uh, knowing that these are very powerful and important and valuable uh, testaments of witnesses to this war, I, I also realized by now, having spoken to hundreds of people quite traumatized by this war, I know how unreliable uh, their, uh, their experiences can be, uh, not because they want to mislead me or something, but people who have survived uh, uh, atrocities and, and, and trauma, uh, several lifetimes worth of trauma. Uh, they are, they, I know that they are in, uh, I know that their own uh, mind tends to protect them from uh, from the worst of it. And for example, I know that, uh, uh, for example, when I'm speaking uh, to a uh, uh, to a survivor of, mul of multiple uh, rape by Russian soldiers whose house was burned down and uh, uh, her husband was killed and she had to flee, I can see how uh, that uh, quite uh, you know almost impossible to process experience skews, for example, their uh, sense of uh, time and space, something that she has perceived as happening uh, within a day actually lasted 10 days. And uh, whereas she, for example, thought she was, she, she walked for a mile, she actually walked, walked for 25 miles. So I, I know how uh, these traumatic experiences can, can, uh, can twist uh, um, a, a person's sense of reality. Uh, so, uh, not to um, uh, cast doubt on their um, on their experiences, but we tend to put everything we re report, if there is a if 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 there is a possibility to do so, to put that in a context. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I'll have to uh, Anna. Uh, uh, I, I I say that uh, uh, the logic would be to ask uh, Tim to uh, to talk because he can combine. Com uh, uh, his experience from the ground and now uh, looking at how media in English, but Anna has to teach. So I will ask Anna Litvinenko to give uh, us an overview of how media in Germany and the debates in Germany have covered the war. And Anna uh, is originally Russian, so she can also follow it in Russian. And I assume in Ukrainian, her name, her last name is Ukrainian and in German. Anna? Right, thank you so much. Uh... Thank you for organizing this. Um, my answer will be uh, twofold. Um, like the media researcher, when we look at the whole range of German media landscape, I would say that the journalists are doing their, their job pretty well. Uh, really, they're trying to give voices, a, a lot of voices to Ukrainians, for instance. There are war reporters, originally Ukrainians, who are writing for uh, German newspapers. Um, and um, you see a lot of um, like you know, also different positions, not the like the Russian position, pro-Russian position, but different positions, different debates in the media. 
Um, I was really surprised by uh, the role that Bild Titan, which is a boulevard medium, actually plays in this role they, in this um, war coverage. They're being really good, actually. I'm really surprised that they're uh, doing this, actually, uh, quality uh, reporting with a, a correspondent on the ground. But they also did, for instance, as many um, as many editorial offices here in Germany, uh, they hired some um, uh, Ukrainian, but also independent Russian journalists who are uh, covering and writing for them. There were, has have been even scandals about uh, what kind of Russians, for instance, are they allowed? Or like, is it ethically okay to hire them? Uh, especially, specifically with Marina Aksyanikova, this um, a lady from uh, the first channel. Uh, yeah, yeah, the first channel, um, State TV, who had this, uh, who did this protest action, and there was like a, a, a lot of, you know, even demonstrations here in in, here in Berlin against uh, like her writing a column for um, for a newspaper. So um, there have been debates, but if you look at the whole picture, I think it's really they're, they're doing a really good job. But uh, like here comes the but because like of course you have uh, in a society nobody reads the whole range of papers and you have this privileges in the society that manifest themselves in media diets and also these conflicts uh, regarding to the war and in Germany you have these privileges very clear like Eastern Western Germany like Eastern Germany the who uh, who tend to be if you have like this uh, see the public opinion polls who are uh, definitely more against uh, for instance weapon uh, experts uh, and who have like more uh, maybe um, um, cautious like you know like uh, problems with um, uh, sanctions with san sanctioning like the the Nord Stream that because they you have the, the whole businesses that also do with Russia so that's there are a lot of uh, different um, factors in there then you have the cleavage which uh, has been uh, which developed itself during the corona um, pandemics you have uh, this so-called querdenke stage like the um, skeptics corona skeptics why they are kind of uh, victimized them here because it's like uh, they networks and they um, specifically on Telegram, but also another social network. Uh, social network, they were infused a lot by Russian propaganda through the whole years and the whole conspiracy theories. If you look at the sourcing, what kind of sources they use, it's very much been infused by Russia. So you still have in this kind of it's it's not uh, visible in a normal uh, coverage, war coverage, but of course at least underground, like in the ice you have on telegram channels a lot of uh, you know this conspiracy theories like russia backed information etc and then you have um, also uh, which is not like maybe a significant cleavage in the civilian society but it becomes visible with this migrants uh, like a spe specifically a very large uh, Russian speaking community in, in Germany. Um, I don't want to generalize it, not at all, because it's like really big. It's about three and, and a half million people who are em immigrants from the post Soviet uh, republics, with 2.4 of them being uh, ethnically Russian Germans. Um, but uh, what we saw um, specifically, maybe you you have heard uh, followed this news about uh, our car courses, car rallies in in German cities, pro Russian, pro Putin. Uh, they're not a lot of people, but they're very loud, and they are kind of really uh, they still consume uh, Russian TV, not like the Russia Today, but really Russian Russian TV. And uh, they totally have this uh, framing of uh, yeah, pro-Russian framing. They spread fears about Russophobia, which is also part of Russian propaganda. And I think it's also very challenging for uh, the German public sphere to deal with it. There has been, for instance, uh, during the 9th of May, also a lot of debates about, um, uh, about the rule that was here um, introduced here in Berlin to ban all the flags, including Ukrainian flags. Because it was like a, a big fear uh, thing, uh, cautious, uh, precautious um, rule to uh, that it could be like could come some to some aggression, you know, uh, while there so there, there are these tensions. So uh, all these privileges and tensions they manifest in the confl conflict we see in uh, also in um, uh, in the coverage. Specifically, right now, I think the biggest debate of the last weeks have been uh, pro and contra uh, weapons, uh, weapon experts, uh, experts, 
and specifically there have been uh, two big like, open letters of uh, German intellectuals. And so you see all these in talk shows all the time, uh, you know, that they're like uh, this camp, which are kind of, they call themselves like pacifists, you know, but it's really like also all these challenges with Natalia talking about, you know, how can you be a, you know, like what is it being a pacifist in a, you know, in this war? Uh, yeah. So uh, do you want to, how you end it? And Etc. So that's like a very complex and um, and also rooted very much in German tradition, German discourse, uh, the uh, the story, but of course also the very pragmatic considerations from uh, from both sides. What I would like to highlight here is the role of uh, German ambassador, uh, which is I, I I'm sure you heard about his very eccentric quote of uh, like uh, offending the German uh, the, the German Chancellor, uh, like calling him. A Excuse leader. me, Ukrainian ambassador, not German ambassador. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah, yeah, uh, Ukrainian ambassador in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Andrei Melnik. Yeah, like, I mean, yes. I mean, like the the yeah the Ukrainian ambassador uh, Andrei Melnik, um, right? And I think he plays, although he is kind of looked at a quite it's, it's a quite like a figure which is not uh, um uh, yeah which is de debated also like how, how kind of his his way of diplomat diplomacy but i think he kind of contributes to or to that this debate goes on it's, it's heated that maybe also that also this shift in public opinion because he is really like like it was his you know he's everywhere like on the talk shows and talking in a very uh, like yeah uh distinct eccentric way so uh i think this uh this really contributes to or to, to 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 more like um to more heated discussion i think again around the weapon so mm -hmm. i would maybe uh stop there not yes just, uh, <laughs> uh i hope we have time for whoever wants to ask anna something as i say uh um, I see there is a question. We shall go to the end and then ask questions. Uh, Anna has to leave at, uh, at 10. Uh, now I would like Tim uh, to give his view. Uh, he was in Ukraine one month before the war started uh, and then for uh, two months after the war started. How did it seem to you uh, when you were there? How does it seem to you now, the war coverage that you are no longer there? Right now you're in the US, but until recently you were in London. Tim, please. Uh, and yes, forgive me if I can't speak as long because, uh, you know, it's um, it's very, I'm, I'm in San Francisco, so it's pretty late here. So I'm still, I'm actually pretty tired. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, I have to say quite simply that, you know, most of the, the mainstream media that, are, that I follow has been pretty good. I mean, I'm talking about the BBC, the New York Times, and, you know, all the big papers have been pretty good. And frankly, you know, it comes down to, to one thing. It comes down to money. You know, the more money you've got, the, you know, the better coverage you're going to get. Uh, you know, at one time at the end of February in my hotel in Kiev, there were uh, 15 people from the New York Times. I mean, 15 and and they were not all in that that hotel. There were more, you know. So that's you know journalists, audio people, videographers. I mean, you know, and they have pretty good coverage. I mean, I don't know if you saw the coverage that uh, that they did uh, yesterday on uh, on war crimes. I think the war crime, if I remember rightly, uh, war crime sort of tracking exactly what happened in a particular war, one of the, the biggest, war, one of the most uh, earliest uh, and most um, prominently reported war crimes from, from Butcher, you know, tracking all the details about it. I mean, this is really good stuff, but it's, you know, it's not rocket science. You know, if you put in the money, you're going to get the results. And um, so uh, that that's what they've done. Um, I mean, I have to say, you, you mentioned uh, the former Yugoslavia and said, what's the difference? Well, I have to say, well, there's a very obvious difference is we can't report on the other side. I mean, it's as simple as that. I would love to go to Donetsk or to Mariupol and uh, report what was happening on the other side, but I can't because it's physically not possible. You know, I can't get a Russian visa. I've tried. You don't, you don't get an answer. It's not possible. That's why there's no coverage from the other side. But in the former Yugoslavia, there was always coverage from from both sides or all sides or three sides or or whatever. So that's that's a huge difference. And, um, you know, obviously that will skew the way we view things because there's only there's only reporting from for, for, from one side, from that side. It's been it's been I mean, it's been good, but it's a shame that we can't report from um, and we can't report what's happening on the other side as well. 
but we can't physically it's physically impossible and that's why you know apart from a couple of uh i mean three extremely pro russian people who put a, you know put out uh, videos on 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 youtube or, or some of them have been banned or but you know on telegram and, and other places but who i wouldn't really consider to be completely i mean i wouldn't really consider them as journalists anyway you know there are no there is no foreign coverage from the other side uh, i mean sorry with a few exceptions there are some local photographers from ap and reuters you know who but the, the, you know they for photographers and they did really good stuff especially uh, and notably in 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 Mariupol but apart from that you know there is really no uh, compare there's no coverage from from the other side apart from with that with that exception uh but Tim you you were in London until recently and uh would you say that the public opinion is aware of the different nuances that appear in the New York Times most people do not read the New York Times uh or it is a black and white uh, picture well i i actually think it is a black and white picture and i think that most people in britain do think it's a black and white picture and and that's another comparison to the balkans i don't think that anywhere in the balkans was a completely black and white picture there were always much more nuances but i think in in ukraine this is a black and white picture and i think that's what most people think i mean you know maybe i'm wrong but that's the impression that i get Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, now I would like to, uh, Laura Perez Restria to tell us uh, uh, what is, uh, how has been the coverage in Spain? Let us not forget that uh, the coverage in Spanish also is, uh, uh, yeah, does not, uh, is not only referring to Spain, uh, it, is, it is also used uh, in many Latin American countries that have a different view of what happens uh, uh, in Europe. And after Laura, I would like Marc Semo that I saw uh, joined to comment on the media coverage in France, and then I shall have live. Uh, Laura, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, the picture in the Spanish media is a little bit uh, different because um, the quality is biased and partisan. And I want to stress that this is the general trend in the narrative of the, of the conflict. Of course, there are some exceptions of, uh, uh, of excellent uh, journalists who, uh, who add nuances and report, um, um, report uh, with, uh, with not this uh, biased perspective. And it is partisan simply because the Spanish media have positioned themselves by defending one of the sides. And we're talking about uh, a rigid alignment with Ukraine's president and what he represents. And in order to understand the Spanish media landscape and the discourse on, the, on this conflict, I should mention that there are no major differences in Spanish media narratives. It is rather exceptional to find uh, alternative voices and uh, editorial policies and political ideology do not make a difference in this sense. And the narrative is biased because as a result of this ideological um, alignment, information that could be negative for Ukraine is silenced and information that could be positive for Russia is also silenced. And now let me give you some examples that illustrate in what way the, the information about the war is partisan and biased. Um, in the months uh, leading up to the invasion, the Spanish media praised the distribution of weapons to Ukrainian civilians, and they just highlighted the advantages that this would bring. But in addition to that, some outlets even explained uh, what foreigners had to do in order to enroll as volunteers in Ukraine, and they explained the specific steps. And here we are talking about leading media in terms of audience. And then, well, for example, with the outbreak of war, Spanish state television channel displayed the Ukrainian flag permanently next to its logo on screen for days. And this has not been done with any other armed conflict uh, in the past. And I think it is also significant to know that this narrative is rather new in the Spanish media landscape. Uh, Ukraine has usually been depicted as a corrupted country uh, with Volodymyr Zelensky being a reaction against mafia-like practices and general distrust against politics. This was the uh, trend uh, narrative. However, they also included Zelensky uh, at one point as a corrupted uh, politician since his involvement in the Pandora Papers. 
But uh, apart from that, Spanish media also um, used to report uh, on marginalization and violence towards social mi minorities uh, within Ukraine. So um, now in the in the context of the of the war, this partisan approach has led to the distribution of inconsistent information and confusing information. And an example of it is that right um, after the in invasion, the Spanish media depicted the, the Russian population as totally against the war, creating the impression that a rebellion against the government throughout Vladimir Putin was imminent. And the media claimed that even within Putin's government, they could be working on a cop against him. But at the same time, another narrative was circulating in the very same media that claimed that Russia's population was alienated and that at the end, they all are like Putin. So following this kind of narratives, it was difficult to know whether the Russians were ready to overthrow the government or whether they were going to join the army and invade Ukraine all, all together. And these are just two examples, but we can find many others, the inconsistencies on the Russian power or China's position are, are also remarkable. And the result of this behavior is that following mass media is not, um, is not very useful in order to be informed about what is happening and what can happen, because everything is based on expectations, wishes, and highly politicized discourse that even clash with reality sometimes. So contextualization is very superficial on both Ukraine and Russia. Information about their politics, uh, economy, their foreign affairs is missing. And in general, the context of the conflict is non-existent in Spanish media. And in this vein, uh, a lot of unverified information based on rumors is distributed. And uh, uh, this is understandable in a war situation. But it is not understandable that there is no warning to the audience that the data are not verified, for example. And uh, we can also point to the failure to rectify false or wrong information as malpractice. And then commentators on Ukraine who are participating in the analysis deserve a special mention. In addition to ideological positioning, another factor comes into play that has a very strong impact on the information that is distributed. And it is the fact that very few are actually experts. And this is particularly true in the case of television. Therefore, there are a lot of mistakes because of ignorance about the region, the language, the culture, etc. I remember a TV report about a Russian attack in the region of Oblast, for instance, so the region of the region. There is also a popular expert who was unable to pronounce the name of Ukrainian cities correctly, but till the point that on one occasion um, he said that there had been an attack, and here I quote literally as he said it, in a town up there, which I do not know how to pronounce. So we missed such important information as where an attack took place. I mean, imagine if you have relatives and friends in Ukraine. And um, I think also that the racist and elitist discourse is, is uh, particularly noteworthy. And this is also shared by all media of different ideologies. In the first weeks of the conflict, it was common to hear, especially on television, how these refugees were different from everyone else. Some comment commentator even mentioned that they were white skinned and blonde. And I also collected a piece of news from a leading mainstream TV broadcaster uh, about a month ago, um, that advised its audience that from then on, they had to be uh, to beware of new Ukrainian refugees because then, by then, the poor ones were also running away from Ukraine. And um, finally, I would like to end by mentioning that uh, it is very common for the Spanish media to show images with Nazi symbols on buildings, objects, or on the bodies of fighters in a positive contextualization. And this has been the case since before the beginning of the war. And since two weeks ago, it has also been common to find testimonies of fighters that wear this type of symbolism or that support the joint groups that promote this ideology. And I'm, I'm aware that this issue has to do with media policies and not that much with the quality of information. 
but um, taking into account the consequences that this type of ideology had in the history of Europe and in the history of Spain, maybe it would worth to take a moment to, to reflect about it and to take responsibility for the consequences it might have to spread it um, through, through media. Miriana, we can't hear you. Thank you so much, Laura. We have 10 minutes. Uh, Marc, are you there? Uh, uh, Marc Semo. Yes, Marc Semo. No, yes, it's, uh, you, you heard me, it's okay? Yes, uh, let me just introduce you. Uh, Marc Semo is uh, the, uh, he's not editor in chief, second to editor in chief of Opinion in Le Monde, uh, has been covering wars and international affairs for a very long time. Marc, you have five minutes maximum. Uh, yeah, because... I, um, I think uh, I will be shorter. Uh, okay. What is your take on how the French media have covered the war in Ukraine and uh, the French uh, public opinion uh, positioning? Yeah. Now, I say the Ben Judab uh, from United Kingdom, uh, also in France, it's a black and white picture. And it's quite normal uh, because there is absolutely no doubt about who is the aggressor and who began the war in Ukraine. And that's the very big difference with former Yugoslavia war. In this time, and especially at the beginning of the Yugoslavia war, in the Croatia war, a lot of French politicians, a big part of the opinion understood or supported the Milosevic point of view, not the Milosevic point of view, but the Serbian point of view, also for the very old and historical links between French and Serbia. Uh, in this war, uh, it, it was different from the beginning. Um, also, a lot of politicians, and if we take the far right party, Front National, um, far left party, um, uh, de Jean Luc Mélenchon, uh, a part also of the right um, wing party, uh, Les Républicains, um, were not hostile to Putin. We have to understand Russia and they avoid to push Russia toward China and so on and so on and so on. It was one of the very current and very usual um, speech in France. With the war, everything changed. It was impossible anymore to defend Putin because the, all the public opinions was absolutely indignated by this war. And on this, for example, for this reason, the question of the war in Ukraine was absolutely absent of the electoral campaign. Obviously, we speak about um, the war, but it was not a topic for discussion of our position and nobody support um, Russian point of view. Um, and also a lot of editorialist opinionists uh, who before support Putin were absolutely mute on this. The second thing, and also is different with, for example, Germany or Italy, there is not in France a very strong pacifist movement. Is very weak. Uh, in France, pacifist is a, uh, in the French memory, it's a total tragedy. You know, it is June um, 94, um, during the second, at the beginning of the Second World War. And the people are to support Ukraine and not to stop the war, but especially um, to permit to Ukraine um, army to, um, to a victory. And uh, also, if Emmanuel Macron was a little more ambiguous, uh, trying to keep an open channel of discussion with Putin, uh, France at the end gave a few weapons to Ukraine, less, less, less than, uh, for example, um, America, of course, but also less than Great um, Britain. But the public opinion supported and want to uh, an engagement um, more of, of the French. Uh, on, on this war, obviously not to be a belligerent, but to have a very um, a more active support. And um, it is under this um, um, pressure of the public opinion that France at the end give cannons like César, very modern cannons uh, to, to Ukraine and, and, and so on. And for the moment, the opinion is clearly with Ukraine in a very, very, very strong way. And for example, and I shall finish with this, um, 
the, the Ukrainian refugees in France are welcomed, and it is very different from the other situation. For example, as you as we saw uh, um, uh, during the Syrian war. Mark, just tell me very, very briefly, is the French opinion uh, aware or is there a clear, uh, is it clear what is the objective of the war to liberate Ukraine or that uh, Ukraine liberates itself or to defeat Russia? Uh, in France, the, um, this question is not for the moment very clear. I think that the consistent part of the public opinion, but not in the, uh, um, on the um, uh, politician, is to uh, defeat Russia. Defeat the Russia. Politician, yes, but for Macron especially. And for um, the most part of the politicians, the important is to um, stop the war, to find a compromise. And we see, for example, that France was in a- What does compromise mean in French terms? When, one of the more reluctant country in Europe for an integration of Ukraine. Also because an integration in Ukraine, of, of short, a quick integration of Ukraine will be, um, will, will significate a war or a very tense situation uh, for, for a lot of time uh, with Russia and the east border of the European Union. Thank you very much. Now, Alif uh, Lensen from Denmark. Denmark is small and I'm sorry I left you for the end and I gave you two or three minutes. Uh, because uh, because the Danish language uh, is not uh, widely read uh, around the world, but at the same time, uh, Denmark has positioned itself from the very beginning uh, uh, with Ukraine, and Denmark is one of the founding members of NATO. Life, please. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Danish, and I may add Nordic media, including Norway and Sweden, which I can follow, have uh, been on the spot with ground reporters since the first day or even before the war. They've done a marvelous and courageous job bringing reports to the audiences despite high risk of their own safety. Two Danish reporters have been hit by bullets in Ukraine. But we've also supplemented by the two other elements that you mentioned, Mirjana, in your introduction, that besides on ground reporting, we have also uh, brought uh, broad uh, analysis, uh, wrap ups, and perspectives. But a third or fourth player has uh, entered this war, uh, which is pretty unprecedented uh, in the amount. The endless amount of eyewitness footage shot from mobile phones on the spot is a new player in the war coverage, at least in our countries. Uh, these amateur uh, recordings have brought us closer to the war than we are used to. But they've also, I must add, posed a challenge in distinguishing fakes from real. Videos from burning skyscrapers in China, bombing scenes from Belgrade 1999, have passed unfiltered into mainstream media as if they were fresh from Ukraine. Fakes, manipulations, and propaganda have flooded like never before, in particular on the social media, and we are not always as uh, good enough to filter them off before they hit mainstream media. So we've had a lot of close-up eyewitness footage, which is good and new, but we've also had a lot of uh, junk, which happened to pass unfiltered. In general, like in many other countries, the war coverage has been professional and straight, I would say, but as a Danish war analyst has put it, it has been very black and white or rather blue and yellow, as he puts it. The media, as the public, has taken a clear stand against Russia and for Ukraine. It's understandable, but it's not necessarily good journalism. Only now, three months after the invasion, a wave of reflections and second thoughts have occurred in the professional discourse. Did we manage to give the full picture? Did we manage to stick to objective reporting of facts? Or did we lean towards what's known from sports reporting with a hero and an enemy hailing the hero and booing the enemy for their deeds? For instance, when the Ukrainian army released images of war prisoners calling their moms, Danish journalists didn't question 
that it's a severe breach of international law on warfare. And when the Danish government decided a highly unprecedented step to deliver arms to a part in an ongoing war, this was historical decision in the Danish political uh, society. We didn't, the journalists didn't question it, only why not more and why not before. So overall, we did a marvelous job. Uh, people are well informed in our countries. We have a free press, nothing is silenced. But once in a while, we had like a blue, yellow filter uh, on our objective reporting. And I hope following an advice from the above mentioned uh, war analyst, he said he's quoted in our professional magazine for journalists for saying, after each war, any army will conduct an in-depth critical and self-critical review of its errors and wrongdoings in order to learn from them and not repeat them. And he suggests that journalists should consider the same procedure and initiate a thorough evaluation when war is over, which I hope will be soon. Thank, Thank you, you so much, uh, Leif. I also hope uh, soon the war will be over. Uh, but us from the Balkans or who have covered the Balkans know that the post-war uh, period is just as difficult. There is no dying, but uh, post-war period is very difficult and most international media leave or leave just a few people on the ground. So uh, then when things uh, get very difficult for the population, Media is not always there. I open the floor now for questions, short comments. We have uh, Philip Noble uh, or Natalia, would you like to make a very short uh, comment on what was said or shall I just um, open? No, no, I want to make a couple of co comments. Um, okay. I also, I think like I regret what a team said uh, myself about impossibility to work in, let's say occupied parts of the Ukraine, but it, it's very difficult to explain what is the other side uh, because, you know, the mostly war is fought on the Ukrainian territory and still despite of not having access, I don't want that we are mislead to understanding that we do not understand what's happening in the occupied territory. So we do know coverage from Crimea from the Donbas, from occupied parts of the Kherson, because the Ukrainians are living there and uh, we have the access to what they're writing, we have access in, through the, all the means uh, to, to understand. So in fact, the Ukrainian media doing quite a lot on that. Uh, it's just not that fancy to do when there is something happening in the city, when you can film it yourself and see with your eyes, uh, probably it's more difficult to, uh, you know, to devote more time on the story, which is harder to get in, and doesn't look that picturesque. So it's 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 not about just success. Uh, of course, we have no access to the Russian soldiers, but that's probably a bit different, a very specific thing. Um, I'd like to also answer to my colleague in uh, from Spain saying that. You know, I do think that we uh, uh, kind of um, sometimes there were a couple of things mentioned, and I think there could be more and more expertise on uh, different things. You know, the people should be better experts on Ukraine and context. But I also think that generally uh, there is no probably need to be overcritical on some things which in the end are marginal. Because if we mention about like uh, calling the foreign troops, they're not fighting in Ukraine. They didn't come. Then probably there are no any, despite of everything, there are no Spanish, maybe one Spanish person fighting in this war. Uh, exactly the same case if, for instance, there was a discussion on giving the, you know, guns for the territorial defense. We didn't have any major major incident within the last months that it kind of was a, a, a in vain or so. So uh, that would be my answer. But I also want to again uh, go back to the idea that this war is indeed black and white and maybe we should search the mistakes in something else. Uh, in some other pre-war coverage uh, which for 20 years kind of ignored or overdone some of the issues in Ukraine uh, fueled by the Russian propaganda. So th I, I think the problems are not really there. And again, um, my main stress would be uh, that, yeah, Ukraine is a democratic society in, in the end and the democratic country. And that's probably the biggest uh, biggest uh, uncovered part of the story in uh, uh, about reporting uh, Ukraine as a zone of conflict. 
Thank you very much. Uh, now, I uh, uh, there was Philip Noble from Prague, uh, uh, editor in chief of Global Voices. Philip, you wanted to ask a question. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for this great opportunity and the sharing. And I really appreciate what you said, Natalia, Natalia about you know not covering the war that actually started in 2014 as part of the reasons why we have this this uh, media coverage the way it is now. But I have a question for Alexei. Uh, because uh, as a Russian speaker, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I've been reading Medusa literally every day for hours. And when I also have a lot of uh, friends in the media area who don't speak Russian, they ask me, you know, what should we read about Ukraine? And I find this interesting because the perception that Medusa was Russian liberal media, I think we can say now in exile, but focusing on Russia. And you have become actually a very interesting source and reliable source on Ukraine in both Russian and English. And so as a media in exile, under terrible pressure, as you explained, Alexei, for all of you in the team, I was wondering if that shift to becoming a source, not just on Russia, but now also on Ukraine, has changed, first of all, your audience, because I know you need to rely on your audience, especially as a media in exile. And also if this is kind of reshaping the way you see yourself now and maybe in the future, as maybe as a more global media. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexei. Um, hi, Philip, and thank you for your kind words. And um, sure, I can definitely say that before the war, the Medusa in English was uh, more or less uh, uh, aimed at an audience of maybe mm, 2,000 people in a, in, a Russia, in a Russia policy circles among uh, foreign reporters uh, and think tanks. So it was a very... Uh, a very niche, a very boutique audience. Now I'm seeing uh, dozens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of page views on, a, on our English website, uh, which is uh, obviously puts us in a very different league. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, uh, and obviously, yes, we now depend uh, on our foreign audience. It's our lifeline because we had to uh, completely restructure our entire business strategy uh, within one year. Uh, first, when we were declared a foreign agent in April 21, and we immediately uh, lost our entire media business, which was based on advertising. And then in April this year, when um, the Russian banks were sanctioned, uh, and uh, we lost about 30,000 um, uh, contributors from Russia, uh, who are now who no, who are no longer, uh, it's no longer possible for them to, to donate money um, to a Latvian co company like Medusa. So we are now completely reliant on donations from abroad. But still, it doesn't really shape or change our policy because our, our only commitment is to, um, is to uh, facts. Uh, and uh, it's not, I, I don't uh, really see how uh, uh, becoming a valuable source for, for, for one audience or, or another uh, would really shape our editorial policies. Uh, because we don't really, uh, you know, I, I always object to being shoehorned into a category like Russian liberal media or Russian exile media. I don't really see myself as, a, uh, as an exile journalist because I'm doing pretty much the same thing I, I, I did in Moscow. I'm, you know, I'm spending uh, 40 and 15 hours a day in front of my laptop doing pretty much the same thing. It's just the, uh, the background on, the, on those rare moments when I go outside is, is a little bit different. But we don't really have uh, um, a line or a position. We don't really have even have op-ads on Medusa. Uh, we released one editorial statement uh, early in, um, in the early days of the war, unequivocally condemning it, uh, because that's what we all felt like a, like a newsroom, like, uh, like, like people. Uh, but since then, we, we you know, we, uh, you, you can't really tell what our position is <laughs> from looking at, at our coverage because uh, we don't want to be seen. We don't really want to be seen as these Russian liberal media or Russian exile media, or whatever. Uh, we had do our job to the best of our uh, to the best of our ability, and we hope that um, our audience, whichever size it is, really uh, appreciates it. So that's <laughs> that's our only goal, really. Uh, are there also, any? Yeah, uh, can I, please can go I, ahead. Can I also use this opportunity to respond to Ginko uh, Kobayashi? Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, so uh, it's so difficult to see the other side coverage, uh, no longer to see RT even. So uh, let me tell you something. If you want to see the um, uh, other side's coverage, um, 
how many how many times do you think we've approached the Russian Defense Ministry for comment, and how many times they've responded? I think it's pretty easy to guess. The answer is uh, we've uh, we've done our duty and approached them for comment every for every single article for many hundreds of articles we've released, and we've received exactly zero re responses. We gave them a chance uh, to give them their side, but they've never responded. So it's uh, uh, obviously if. Uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, or the uh, <coughs> foreign media have been barred from uh, reporting from the occupied part of Ukraine uh, in Donetsk and Luhansk since uh, 2016, because the uh, Russian side is simply not issuing any visas to uh, foreign reporters. And it's expelling uh, the, uh, uh, for the for foreign uh, news bureaus from, uh, from Moscow. So um, I think the, uh, the, the answer to this is pretty clear. You're not seeing the, uh, the other side coverage because it's not allowing any coverage from its, its, its side. Uh, also, uh, uh, it's no longer possible to watch RT, but if you want to see the uh, Russian perspective, is uh, you just you, uh, if you want to see the Russians' point of view, you can, you, if you want to get a load of uh, you know denial of basic facts, if you're really in, into this kind of thing, you can just go to the Russian Foreign Minister's website because RT, when it was available, didn't deviate from that uh, one inch. So uh, uh, <laughs> yes, if you want to see the the Russian side, the the other side. Uh, point of view, just, you know, go to the Russian Foreign Minister's website and you'll see it. So, yeah, that's, uh, I don't think that should be a problem for anyone. Thank you. Um, any other, uh, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, or The thing is, uh, let me see uh, who raises their hand. Uh, is, are there any? Uh, yes, Frani Marovic, please. Introduce and please introduce yourself, Rani. Please. Uh, th thank you, Mirjana, and th thank you for everybody for this very interesting conversation. I'm Frane Marovic. Um, um, my sort of experience straddles both the Balkans and uh, Ukraine as well. Now I'm working on internet governance issues, but I worked for many years in uh, Bosnia in post war time. I was not there covering the war, uh, but I also um, was working for the OSC. Um, during Ukraine, during the Maidan, I was in 2014 um, in Crimea with a, a representative of freedom of the media when we were also detained by the so-called separatist or the little green man in there. And I've been following the conflict from then on. And one of the things that was interesting for me, and it's unfortunately something that we could also learn from the experience in the Balkans, is how to keep the attention of the, in this case, we're talking about Western audiences, or European audiences to an ongoing conflict. I think at some point it will stop being at the front of the headlines, it will sort of drop down and it will become less interesting. If you take the example of the conflict in uh, uh, Donbass in 2014, what most people don't realize, I'm sure Ukrainians know this very well, but the conflict did not go away. Uh, there were still there were still fighting. There were ceasefire um, uh, breakages. There were people getting being killed on a regular basis. But this was not something that was high on the uh, media um, attention and on the media sphere. So I think my question would be, you know, do we do we fear in a way that the conflict might become less interesting and uh, people might get sort of a fatigue of it and how to keep it how to keep it? Uh, I would like to reply. To, uh, and I and the second point just... is. How do how do we engage the Russian audiences? I know I know all, all about the blockade of the internet in in Russia, uh, the foreign agents legislation, the problems and so on. But I think un, unless there is some kind of information sphere going into Russia, and again, with the experience of the Balkans, I remember there was a there was a strong. Uh, effort by uh, many countries to get information into uh, especially Serbia uh, but also into Bosnia and Croatia and so on uh, how to how to get to the Russian audiences those are, would be two my two points I would like to put to the panel thank you thank you uh, uh, Tim would you like to address the first question and Alexei and uh, Natalia the second one just, just rem remind me what was the first question? The question is how to keep uh, the audience attention because there is a fatigue. Well, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, you can't sort of artificially keep something on the, the top of the news. If the, if the story is not changing, then it's going to drop down. I mean, I don't think there's any artificial way to do it. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's like, it's as simple as that. I don't, you, you can't do something artificially. I wasn't thinking of artificial it then. I was just thinking that the fact that the war will probably continue, but it will stagnate and the people will not be 
in a way, it will not be seen as the sort of the, 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 new, the new topic, while I guess uh, the situation will still continue to deteriorate. I hope not, but... I mean, I mean, yes, but it, but it's you know, I mean, also the situation after two thousand fifteen, sixteen. I mean, it disappeared from the from 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 the media because you know not that much happened. I mean, frankly, the line didn't move one inch, and I think you know in the last year, I mean, Natalia will correct me, but I think like fifty six people died. I mean, it was terrible for fifty six people, but now fifty six people die every twelve hours. You know, so. There was a reason it wasn't in the media because not much happened. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tim. Life, would you like to comment on this and then have Alexei and uh, yes, Life? please, yes, please. Uh, to uh, to Frane, I think Frane has a point here. Uh, if our job as journalists and media is to give a proper image of the world, we also need to focus more on pre-war and post-war events no matter the amount of deaths, to quote uh, Tim. Uh, at a public debate on uh, media coverage before the war, uh, one of the outstanding Danish reporters on ground in Ukraine uh, put it this way. She tried, uh, to, she tried to put focus on the war from 2014 uh, up until 2022, the eight years before the full-scale invasion. And she didn't succeed. And she, she said, kind of the following. She said, uh, the problem is that low intensity conflicts are not presable. Uh, if the same number of people die every day by the same reason in the same region, it's no news. It's cynical, she added, but this is the way the news works. I think it's the pre-war and post-war focus that we are lacking. Uh, they may be as relevant for an understanding of the world as is uh, the ride out war with lots of deaths. Thank you very much, uh, Alexei, and then Natalia. Um, okay, so to reach the Russian yeah. audience, and then Natalia. Um, uh, all my experience as a Russian journalist um, reporting for for uh, for an outlet that's blocked in Russia tells me that it's uh, it's really not the issue of access. So, for example, there are some some technological solutions. Uh, for example, Reporters Without Borders are helping us uh, with a uh, with a very very resource intensive uh, but very effective solution to circumvent the blocks. So they're basically setting up a series of rota rotating series of mirror websites uh, that is. Uh, uh, the Russian censorship ministry just kept, can, cannot really keep up with blocking them all. Uh, but it demands an, uh, um, an immense amount of traffic. Uh, so it's only possible for, it's not a long-term solution, so it's not, it's not a permanent solution, but it helps. Uh, also, uh, sure, you can provide all Russians with a, with a gratis uh, VPN access. Uh, that is That could also help like, distribute... Uh, uh, free uh, uh, basic VPN accounts to um, anyone uh, user with a Russian a IP address. Th that could also be a solution, but the problem is not access. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, convincing uh, an average Russian person whose diet consists of uh, Russian state media to make the conscious effort to consume this kind of information. And that is the problem because it's really not the... Uh, uh, not 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 the Cold War. No, it's not the uh, we're not behind some kind of iron curtain because all it really takes you to uh, uh, to access information uh, to to access a news outlet like Medusa is a couple of extra clicks, but it takes an immense amount of effort to, to convince a person to to uh, to to, take, uh, to make those extra extra clicks. Uh, because I've learned in my uh, yeah, it's actually uh, a division that runs across uh, millions of Russian families, and including mine, um, and. Um, uh, uh, that uh, even people who have, uh, 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 even Russians who live abroad and have access to uh, all the un unfiltered so sources of information, simply refuse to uh, even acknowledge that these uh, that these fact that this 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 reality exists, a reality in which Russia is invading Ukraine. Uh, uh, and it's uh, it's not that the Russian state propaganda is that so devilish, devilishly effective. It's that it 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 just provides uh, their uh, its consumers with a uh, with a convenient you know it's another convenient brick into their worldview where Russia is the permanent victim, is the aggrieved party, uh, which was only forced to uh, uh, to engage in this. You cannot really call it war. It's a special operation 
Um, so it's uh, you, what, what you're asking uh, by sending someone a, a link to Medusa, for example, is not just to read and say, okay, yes, this is, ha this is happening. This is, ter this is really terrible. What you're asking them uh, is to acknowledge that the country is, uh, is, um, uh, 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 is committing war crimes. And uh, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And I've learned it uh, the hard way with, uh, with, with my own relatives that uh, uh, even, even if you are, uh, uh, even with people who, you, uh, who implicitly trust you, uh, you can spend, and if you can afford to spend hours and hours with them, educating them about the true nature of this war, and maybe you will succeed this one time, but the next morning they will see the news bulletin um, on the Russian state media and revert to their old uh, con convenient and familiar way of thinking uh, about this war. So it's really not about, uh, you know, simply providing uh, people with access which are lacking. They're not really lacking any access. So it's, you know, it's, there's, there, there is online censorship in Russia, but it's fairly easy to circumvent even without any um, spe special knowledge. So um, yeah, this, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, there are some, uh, some long and short-term solutions to this, but uh, they are not really solutions of the uh, larger problem. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Uh, so I think it, uh, I, I, for the last week, I spent uh, quite a lot of time in the region of Kharkiv, which is a border region with Russia. And I think it's quite similar that many people for many years, for, for first months of the war, tried to talk to their relatives and then they given up because they said it's like talking to the people who are hypnotized or just possessed with a different view of the world. Uh, while uh, quite a few Ukrainian top bloggers were on the top bloggers in Russia prior to this war. And I talked to one of them who done incredible travel show and had incredible high rating in Russia and in the occupied territories. And he said like, it's all gone, you know, because if he uh, provides something which is uncomfortable to his, to his larger audience, it just doesn't work. So we can pair it, for instance, with the American show business when, for instance, somebody would do something democratic and the audience is, you know, Republican. They just don't don't do that. But I don't want to underestimate also the effort given by the Russian propaganda. I want really strongly to present this example. Wherever I go in the liberated territories, I find the very same issue of the uh, Komsomolska Pravda, the largest uh, Russian uh, paper. Um, it was a special editions and the people usually say in those liberated villages that that was a paper handed by them by the Russian military and by which they explained uh, why the war is fought, why they attack Ukrainians, why they keep them in the basements. Uh, it's totally like uh, explanation of the war by Putin with all the fake stories telling that the Western media are doing provide a fake uh, coverage and things like that. What was striking for me that the, they have a 7 million circulation. There was a name of the people who worked on this paper kind of a very clear thing as if it's journalism. And I think we, we kind of, in this discussion for seven years, I was a bit reluctant and was saying that maybe we overdo the story about the fake news and Russian propaganda, it was too much. You know, uh, your point uh, to say that maybe partially propaganda, you know, does something, sometimes there is something in that. Uh, having seen that, I just seen clearly how the Russian state and propagandistic media are clearly instrumentalized in uh, waging this war and what they were providing is a 20 years 20 years of the coverage which dehumanized ukrainians which allowed the russians to think about the ukrainians the way they think and to wage the war and, and that's something also to be addressed i shortly want to address i see the raised hands but i want to address about the um, foreign media interest i don't see the problem uh i see that the media would come in in particular because of the logistical thing it's very hard to get to syria it's very hard to get to yemen it's very easy to work in ukraine ukraine is a super open country it's cheap to, it's cheap to come it's very nice to stay there you can have a luxurious life in Lviv and then go to the front line, you know, with, with everything. You have a huge amount of the Ukrainian and English speakers. Uh, my problem is rather that the, the Western journalism is working in this way of the searching for escalation. So if you have Bucha, you go to another place and you search something like that and it's not there. So, you know, unless the story is more horrible than your previous story, this story isn't covered. So I was just in the discussion with the Last week, 12 press officers uh, in Kharkiv of the different platoons 
uh, they were called by the journalists in Kharkiv for the discussions how to coordinate the work of the foreign reporters. And at first I was on the side of the reporters, to be honest, saying that they are not allowed to get to a lot of places. The next day we went, we went uh, together and there are a lot of great international reporters. But Ukrainian press officers of the army, given the task by the government that they should be open for foreign press, they should show things around, they have nothing to hide because Ukraine is democratic and there are so many war <laughs> crimes, but anything I think, it's the same stories of, let's say, TV stations traumatizing the same people in those villages. And people just, you know, trying to get to the places which are incredibly dangerous because of the artillery shelling. So I think there is also another discussion because I think that there are a lot of very good Western journalists, but there, there are those who just coming not to tell the story, but to do a report from the front line, which has no <laughs> much uh, political sense, but uh, put in danger their lives and put in danger and kind of create this, um, this this story when people are searching for the rapes and other crimes in the place where, where they're not. And for me, it's underestimating the other troubles. Uh, but finally, uh, I see I'm speaking a lot. I think that there is a great potential in reporting Ukraine to get out of this logic of the escalation and pure conflict, but looking for the uh, incredible examples of the resilience. There are very little, the public is very, eager to listen to these stories, to inspiring stories, because if there is a fatigue for compassion, but there is no fatigue for the inspiration. And Ukraine is a place for so many of those stories of how people are really uh, rebuilding the country and what they're doing, that could be the good way out. Thank you very much, Natalia. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, how to treat uh, victims and uh, uh, how to deal on, uh, on the fr uh, with the frontline journalism, it's a different event and uh, maybe we can do it. It is, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, Laura and then uh, Christian, um, please, Laura. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that I was just uh, depicting the situation in the Spanish uh, media landscape. And I think it's not relevant how many Spanish or Latin America, uh, for those who, who follow Spanish media, fighters went to Ukraine. But to reflect about this kind of discourses short in leading media, is it OK? What are the consequences? First, because of what it means from the point of view of objectivity. And secondly, because they might open a very dangerous path. I, I just wanted to add this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, Christian, please, could you please uh, introduce yourself, Christian? Sure. Hi, my name is Christian. I'm an editorial coordinator at NOS, this an international journalist network and media NGO in Berlin with a focus on also Eastern Europe. And um, my apologies, maybe I'm also turning now this uh, discussion to something uh, blue, yellow, and I have another question to Natalia. <laughs> um, so regarding uh, independent media in Ukraine, could you maybe share your view on the role of uh, independent media and journalists during the war in Ukraine, of Ukrainian uh, journalists and media? And um, right now there is a lot of funding, international funding going into <clears throat> support of exile media, also Russian exile media. Do you feel the same support um, for Ukrainian independent media? Will it survive this war? And another question is about uh, this uh, post-war situation. Is there already headspace in Ukraine uh, for thinking about what comes after uh, the war uh, in terms of possible problems, challenges, conflicts inside Ukrainian society? Thank you, Christian. Go ahead, Natalia. We have about two or three minutes. We'll extend, but we have to finish. I know it's very short, but sorry. So uh, the uh, so the independent media are at the, at the heart of it. They are absolutely just yesterday. Time magazine put among three top influential, you know, people in the globe the Ukrainian president, the head of the army and the editor in chief of the independent paper, which is known for its criticism. Uh, because everybody reads independent media, they are running the debates, despite we have kind of oligarchic channels, people don't really, really care that much about that, to be honest. They are really doing this marathon, uh, joint marathon between different countries, uh, between different oligarchy groups. Imagine like Fox News and uh, CNN are doing something together. Uh, so, uh, 
but under one um, one uh, umbrella. Uh, the support is necessary. It's not yet there. It's coming, but Ukrainian problems are very different from the Russian because, again, it's mainly logistical. Something team said about the having enough of transportation to go to the villages, having enough of fuel, having the opportunity to really be on the ground because it's the most critical and it costs the money. This support is incredible. And this war fought in the communities outside of Kiev, it really requires a lot of this. And none of the Ukrainian newsrooms were fully, um, fully, um, you know, ready for that, of course, and it can't be. Um, as for the uh, future, I think that it's there, but there is a, one idea about the rebuilding. You know, a lot of things are postponed. So the constant discussion is like, we have this political debate, let's talk about the war. Now there is a discussion that it's already time to discuss that, uh, you know, three months is enough. Uh, but the main, uh, one of the biggest discourse in Ukraine is really rebuilding the country about the war. I mean, uh, but it's it's also about the infrastructure and economy. So these talks are, are still are here. Well, I'm glad uh, uh, that you have finished on something that is about the, uh, about the future. Uh, our time is up. Uh, as you all know, uh, the objective of our seminars is to uh, create, uh, 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 to inspire, to inspire journalists to write, uh, and also to create uh, networks among journalists and academics. Uh, I think this was a very useful discussion. If you think that we should uh, uh, add more topics to this discussion on media, it's just enough to send me uh, or send us uh, an email and we shall uh, organize more. For the time being, we have, uh, I, I would like only to announce an event on the 9th of uh, June in the afternoon at four, I shall send you the invitation. We shall have two US speakers explain media sorry, uh, U.S. Uh, policy towards Ukraine in the light of the political situation in the U.S., as well as uh, the opinion of the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, public uh, regarding the uh, the U.S. policies uh, towards Ukraine. So I, because the, uh, we do think that uh, U.S. is a very important uh, player here. I thank you all. And if you have any comments or if you want, or if you think we should continue this discussion, we shall be happy to organize it. Uh, Daniela? Thank you very much to our speakers and thank you to you, Miliana, for organizing uh, and making these talks possible. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. We will close the room in a few moments. Have a good day.